Good morning. Uh, I think um, this is the real segment that we have been waiting for, Minister. In fact, I addressed them in my opening address um, that is, in fact, it's all full of energy throughout the day, I must say, even though it's in the midweek, uh, this is indeed an a prop next uh, mid-year convention. Thank you so much for accepting. And this is not the first time because exactly three years ago, yes. you came to our convention, but that was in a different setting of physical connecting with our 4,000 salespeople. But today we are no lesser. But what is the benefit today here is this, Minister, as you, your department and yourself has agreed to go Facebook Live, we have got hundreds of people in Facebook Live connected to this segment, and as well as a lot of our connections who are in our Zoom platform. So with that, Minister, before I start the conversation, maybe I give you some air time to just say something. Thank you, Ismail. And first, a very good morning to all our friends uh, from Pop Propnex. Uh, as uh, CEO had mentioned, three years ago, I had the privilege to join you all at, uh, at your annual convention. It's, uh, it's an electrifying uh, uh, experience uh, to see so many uh, people from the PropNex family meeting, also an occasion for us to share the government's perspective on real estate and property measures. Uh, you know, we are, we are now in a different uh, world with the pandemic hanging over all of us, but nevertheless, very encouraged that PropNex uh, has remained at the forefront, uh, leveraging on digital technology to connect uh, with the whole community and to get your message across. Uh, this is a difficult period for many Singaporeans, and many sectors as well, including the real estate sector. And I know that uh, many real estate agents are also facing difficulties. And I'm, I'm glad that the Propnex is uh, uh, innovating, but also showing care and concern. I understand that uh, you've given support to many of your agents who face difficulties. But in turn, the Propnex community has consistently over the years, in good times and bad, been very generous in giving to the less fortunate in Singapore. Uh, reaping the fruits, but giving back significantly uh, to Community Chest. And on behalf of the uh, Community Chest, I'd uh, like to say a very big thank you for your thank strong you so support. Much. Thank you so much. Minister, um, I mean, when I just did some research, and actually you have a very strong legal background in your education. Yes. I noticed that you are even a deputy uh, prosecutor, yes. if I remember. Yes in the AG, AG Chambers, chambers yeah. yes. And thereafter, you're also a Deputy Director, uh, Ministry of Law, Policy, Division. Yes. And I see a huge amount of legal background mm. and in 2013, mm. appointed as an MOS, Ministry of National Development, mm. 2015, promoted to Senior Minister of State, 2017, Second Minister, mm. and recently, Minister for National Development. Why am I trying to highlight here is this impressive seven years. So you're not new to no. Ministry of National Development. That gives us huge amount of confidence. But I also think it is a huge responsibility. It is. So Minister, my simple question here is this. What are the key priorities mm. during your term as our Minister for National Development? And what is in the top of your agenda during your term? I think uh, immediately uh, we want to continue to support the multi-ministry task force because the pandemic is still ongoing. Uh, the future is still uncertain. Uh, the public health risks are still great. And so we contribute through providing quarantine and, and stay home notice uh, facilities in support of the public health efforts. But there are also other immediate priorities. You know, so immediate, then the midterm, and then there are longer term. Uh, the, mid, mid, the immediate term is not just the uh, pandemic work, but also uh, getting the construction sector back on its feet again. Uh, because you know, construction is really uh, an important part uh, of, uh, of our, our city rejuvenation. And in fact, the real estate sector is intimately tied into the construction sector because construction timelines, delivery of units, they're all uh, interrelated. Uh, the construction sector has gone through a tremendously uh, difficult period and we want to get them back on their feet again, provide them support, enable construction to restart. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, linked to that is uh, delivery of people's homes, whether it's uh, HDB homes, whether it's private sector homes in the, in the private market, uh, people are waiting for their keys. And so by supporting the construction sector, enabling them to restart safely, we hope that we can ensure that people waiting for their homes get their homes on time. 
but uh, in the uh, mid and long term, we continue to uh, strengthen our efforts to make Singapore green, livable and sustainable. Uh, and so there are many aspects to that. First, of course, we continue to look at how we can ensure that housing, especially public housing, uh, remains affordable, livable and meets the aspirations of Singaporeans. So we'll continue to look at uh, these aspects. Uh, we want to also build a sustainable city and grow a city in nature. And I think that will, in real estate terms, make uh, living in Singapore um, a much more comfortable, conducive and livable city. So the greening efforts, the urban transformation, the sustainability efforts uh, need to continue. Uh, but uh, there's also a lot of uh, uh, efforts that uh, we need to undertake to transform the construction sector, the built environment sector, from development to architecture to engineering to construction uh, to subsequently facilities management in the real estate sector is part and parcel of the whole continuum of transformation. And uh, using uh, digitalization as the spine that runs through the entire value chain from conceptualization, construction, all the way to facilities management and then, of course, real estate uh, agency work. Uh, all of that will be transformative in the way we uh, strengthen uh, our whole built environment sector. Thank you, Minister, because I didn't mean a huge amount from a macro perspective, but two things actually uh, came out which mm. I would like to ask a further question. We've talked about public housing, HDB, and there are million owners, HDB owners. The new pandemic has even shifted the way we live and work. Yes. Do you think in terms of design concept in the mm. near future for public housing, where more people are expected to work and as well as live. Uh, and you know, one of the key concerns people always say here is this, these days the newer HDB homes are much smaller than compared to the older HDB homes. Yes. Will that be something that is worth considering and looking at? You know, certainly um, during the uh, pandemic, especially during Circuit Breaker, the home has uh, transformed in terms of the roles we have to bear. Not just the home, but the family. So if you recall during Circuit Breaker, where we had to shut schools and uh, preschools uh, and people had to work from home. Uh, Singaporeans, all of us, were forced to adapt to the imperatives that public health measures foisted upon us. So the home is not just a, a place for the family, not just a place where we dine and, and, and meet with family and, and live, but it also became the workplace, it be also became the classroom, it also became a pseudo childcare centre, and also remain a place of uh, intense caregiving responsibility. And uh, whilst this is confined to the circuit breaker and to some extent still remains so today while we are under this pandemic climate, uh, my ministry and, and our colleagues, we are, we, are, we are closely watching what this pandemic leaves behind as a lasting legacy, not just uh, nationally, but in the psyche of Singaporeans, the expectation of what work means and what caregiving means but also companies are all adjusting, adapting because companies going through this uh, tremendous painful period uh, in a forced experiment where they have to uh, get their staff to work from home uh, and having invested in the technology to enable them to remain as productive as possible uh, are going to make some decisions too. Yeah. So not just national level decisions or individual decisions for us as employees and workers but bosses, and I'm sure you too will be thinking through how can uh, companies to be more resilient? Yep. How can work from home or telecommuting be factored into? And so that will have implication on, say, uh, office space, on home design, yep. on neighbourhood design. And uh, we're having emerging uh, stronger conversations. Okay. And these will be part and parcel okay. of the uh, conversations we're going to have with Singaporeans and with businesses yep. to see what we need to do to transform our design, to transform our neighbourhoods, uh, to provide the amenities and support, not just for working from home or telecommuting or workspaces, but also for, say, retail, mm. uh, because people are buying things differently yep. altogether. So it really looks like the pandemic has really brought us to a really a new norm, yes. the way not only we work, we live, we shop, we eat, and so on. Yes. And that's why I really think I'm glad that, I, uh, Minister, as you said, this is, will be brought towards the community and more discussions and maybe the people involved mm. uh, I think it is maybe timely really to look at even the design and the house sizes. One of the key things, I mean, people always say that 
they want a bigger space, but again, it's a matter of cost and the price. Yes. Uh, There's something they mm. always struggle with. Mm. I mean, the last point, maybe since we talk about HDB, maybe I'll just ask one more HDB questions before we move on. Sure. And I'm not so sure whether this is going to be heavy on your shoulders during your term, simply is the lease decay. Yeah. Uh, one of the key concerns about the lease decay here is, is there are HDB properties that are already less than 50 years right now. Mm. And I assume, assuming in your term of the next five years, if you continue to hold this portfolio and not been shifted and promoted any higher, then I think some of the HDB will even hit below the 45 year mark. And I remember that we have got a lot of home improvement schemes for those, they are older flats, but someday we will have to tackle this issue and that has always been the concern. Mm. Will this be one of the top agenda for you? Certainly, the rejuvenation of our estates, the uh, ability to monetize our housing assets, including uh, leasehold properties, uh, all these are things that we need to continue to look at. And certainly, during this term, we'll continue to develop uh, the details for uh, HIP2 uh, as well as uh, VERSE, uh, amongst other things. You know, in, in the real estate uh, business, many of your agents would have uh, visited estates uh, many, many times. Yep. by, by sh showcasing properties to your clients and would have seen our estates over the years change and evolve. And so by visiting certain old estates, you see the before and after and the impact of uh, both home improvement as well as neighbourhood renewal, what it has on the, the, the outlook of a property, the livability of the surroundings and all these uh, certainly will have an impact uh, on, on, on the property and on people's uh, insights into those uh, homes. Uh, but you've also, as real estate uh, consultants and advisors, also uh, seen uh, estates that have completely rejuvenated. Mm. So we are here in Topayo. And so Topayo Town, you can see old Topayo, you can yeah. see middle-aged Topayo, you can see young Topayo. You can also go to Margaret Drive and see... Uh, I, I, as a child, used to go there frequently to, to, to mm. frequent the uh, neighbourhood centre, the hawker centre, and, mm. and, and be in the estate. Uh, and I've seen it completely change yep. from an old estate to then became uh, green. Yep. Uh, and then now, uh, new housing typology is coming up and it's very, very different. Yep. And so that is the, the future of public housing uh, that you see today uh, manifesting itself in different uh, typologies but also looking very, very different uh, from the HDB that we are currently uh, living in. And so that is the uh, rejuvenation and the future of public housing. And that has to take place systematically. Yep. In the early days, uh, older Singaporeans will, will remember that Singapore was a large construction site. Yep. Lots of areas felled and then lots of construction taking place all over the island. As our housing stock for public housing grows older. We have to start planning early for the future of public housing because Singaporeans' expectations will change. They're, 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 they're more discerning about what they'd like to have at, in, at, at home and in their surroundings, the kinds of amenities. And so we will have to systematically plan the rejuvenation of Singapore yep. as a whole. And so means such as VERSE and HIP2 allow older housing to, to remain livable and, uh, and comfortable, but at the same time, through a systematic planning of verse, allowing people also to make choices on their own, but also as a community, uh, to plan the orderly rejuvenation of our health housing estates and bring the future of public housing uh, to, to realisation. Yep. But of course, older Singaporeans living in older flats or Singaporeans living in older pro properties often are worried about the ability to monetize those flats. Exactly. Because that's the key. Issue that's the key. Yeah, yeah. So, so in Agreed. a sense, uh, the housing uh, options and monetization options will also not be unfamiliar to you and to your, to your colleagues because I'm sure that uh, many of your clients would have asked you and you would have advised them uh, on options such as, say, renting a room. You know, how can you help me find a client who can mm. customer? Uh, how can I uh, stay with my children? Can I market my flat and sell it? Mm. Uh, or should I stay with uh, somebody, my, my, my children, or another property, private property, and then to rent out my, uh, my, my old home? Mm. Can I monetize an older flat, even though yeah. it's, it's uh, built in the 70s or yeah. early 80s? And of course, your, 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 your colleagues would also have advised them on, uh, on uh, options such as the silver housing bonus, yep. enhanced lease buyback. Yep. All these are, 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 are tools and levers, yep. uh, government policies that enable 
Singaporeans to realise value out of uh, older flats as well. So that whole range mm. uh, are available. Some of it is macro level, but requiring individual and, 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 and community commitments yep. as to whether they want to continue living in an old but rejuvenated flat or have their estate uh, uh, revitalised yep. uh, through, through verse. Minister, thank you for a very long answer, but that matters because we are talking about million households staying in public housing. Yes. I agree with you. I think none of us doubt in terms of rejuvenations of the estates, the mm. older become more livable and so on. But one of the concerns people had, which I think we will still need time uh, moving uh, forward, yes. is the capital value of the uh, lease that are dropping. Mm. Uh, because for some of them, yes, you are totally right. They can rent to monetize. Mm. Uh, they can always upgrade and so on. Mm. Uh, I suppose this is still in the making, yes. uh, eventually to find a solution yes. to some of our uh, HDB owners with the lease that are dropping. Mm. Uh, fine, I think it's good, the answer from a macro perspective, yes. as I said, a lot more work. Macro and micro as well. Yes, fine. And it's a continuous yes. work in progress. Agree. Yeah. Minister, I would like to go mm. on to the next uh, topic from a public housing to maybe a real estate sector itself. Yeah. In fact, what has happened here is this, the pandemic has shifted uh, or even brought some uncertainty mm. for some of the people who want to be a real estate agent. I see. Okay, maybe how do I say that here? This be, I, and, and this is, we respect that and we accept that because of social safety measures mm. uh, and health is often a first priority in the pandemic. Mm. So what has happened here is this, the RES exams mm. for in the month of February and June yeah. has been mm. postponed. Yes. But on the other hand, our estimate probably there are maybe close to 4,000 people who have attended the exams, uh, the classes before. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them set for the exam but fail. Uh, and all these people are waiting, when will the exam start? No doubt CEA has started the first exam in September. Yeah. Only 800 slots. Yes. Uh, and again, when I look mm -hmm. at it, a lot of service industry today retrench. I mean, we talk about a very good many friends from the either SQ or yeah. any other service. And these are the people who are very comfortable talking to people and maybe entering in the real estate business. They're very strong people skills. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But one of the unfortunate things here is this, nothing is certain because we have a backlog of a few thousand people and the dates are not out for October, November, December. Mm. And there are many people who may think that, that now that I've got retrenched mm. and I've got this six month, eight month, 10 month savings, can I jump into another skill set? Sure. But unfortunately, they are not exempted. So that my two point here is this. Mm. I seriously think it's worth considering to come out more dates of uh, in, in frequency to clear the backlog. Yeah. And number two, should we not even consider mm. to go into a digital platform mm. to do online examinations where most industries yes. are able to do that rather than confining this to a physical sitting down and doing these exams mm. and that is not helping the industry in terms mm. of its growth and especially those people who are mm. right now not able to get a slot. Yeah. No, thank you for your, for your advocacy on behalf of the uh, real estate community and also for your leadership, your thought leadership in coming up with very good solutions uh, to help the industry and to help Singaporeans during this difficult time. Uh, I, I do uh, apologise for the inconvenience that this has caused to uh, many people who have been waiting for the uh, RES exams. Uh, the good news, as you say, is that the RES exams resume tomorrow. Yes. And for, so, for those of you who are, are busily preparing for this while or tuning in, I uh, thank you for, for double hatting and doing two things at the same time. And I wish you all the best uh, for tomorrow's exams if you're, uh, you're taking it tomorrow. Uh, certainly, uh, the cohort tomorrow, which is about 800, 800, all the slots have been taken, is a far cry from what we're typically used to, a big hall with some, a few thousand yes. uh, uh, exam, uh, students taking the exam. Uh, but the, the, the pandemic has wrought this upon us and we've had to uh, operate in a, in a safe environment for your own well-being and health and that of your family as well. But uh, certainly, uh, CAA will uh, identify more slots uh, later this year, uh, as well as next year. And I, I seek uh, everyone's uh, patience and understanding as we uh, find new ways in which uh, we are able to conduct these exams. And certainly, uh, Ismail, you're quite right, uh, that uh, digital solutions and hybrid solutions allow us to uh, uh, continue to run these examinations while keeping everyone safe. So we'll take your views on board. Thank you so Thank much, you. Minister. <coughs> I mean, even if the exams are <coughs> not conducted immediately, mm. the dates will allow people to plan 
what resources they have, whether can they wait yes. to for the attempt, or maybe they can uh, go ahead with something else. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Thank you so much. Indeed. Thank you so much. Yeah. Minister, the other thing here is this, <clears throat> with the ever-changing and evolving real estate sector, uh, and further uh, due to the pandemic and so on, how do you see the role of real estate agents? And do you really think there's a future for real estate agents in the Singapore's economy? That there will always be. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Singaporeans have, have, have changed as well. Uh, you know, the expectation, uh, their, their tax savviness quotient has gone up. Uh, they're more discerning. And, uh, but nevertheless, you know, in, in, in searching for a property, whether it's a residential, whether it's for investment, uh, whether it's office space or, or commercial or industrial, uh, they will always benefit from the wisdom and the experience uh, and the, the diligence and, and, and industry of, of real estate consultants in helping to identify uh, possible candidates for them to look at for the objectives that they seek. And so as Singaporeans uh, become more sophisticated in their, in their expectations and more multivariate in their, in their needs in finding a property for, for whatever reason, uh, the expectation on the real estate agents and consultants will continue to go up. And so uh, in, in, in 2017, 2018, we had the real estate uh, industry transformation map and, and you and Propnex and many of the other uh, estate agencies have been really at the forefront, seeing that uh, this is a sector which needs to transform yes. or potentially be disintermediated by external forces. Yep. And by Singaporeans who themselves are being a lot more tax savvy and able themselves to to do some basic work. And, and so the upskilling of, the, uh, the, of your colleagues, your arming of uh, real estate agents with technology and tools, your partnership, including what you've done this morning, uh, with uh, other sectors and with the media and with online platforms, are really efforts to enable uh, our real estate workforce to upgrade, upskill, and to meet the growing expectations of Singaporeans. And I think, uh, it's not just about technology and skills that I recall mentioning in 2017 when I visited you at your, your annual convention that it's about trust and it's about relationships yes. and it's about earning the trust of Singaporeans that it's not just uh, the, the agent, agency that I service I'm looking for but I trust these individuals yes. whether from Propnex or Hutton's whichever, whatever agency I trust them uh, I built a relationship with them they've got good reviews and they're armed with a good set of skills and can value add to my needs. Yep. Yeah, totally agree. Minister, I think the real estate salesperson, we strongly believe, mm. has a value add proposition. Yes. And as exactly you said that this morning, we really want to bring this, the digitalization process to another notch. Yes. Uh, mm. and, and the main objective of when we had this signing ceremony in terms of partnering MediaCorp at 99.co mm. is to bring to the comfort of the consumer's yeah. information. And today, as you said, the behavioural pattern of the consumers have hugely changed. Yes. Um, people have been more productive and they want information mm. at a speed. And as well as not just information, it is the virtual reality of looking at things in different dimensions. Yes. Uh, and we are happy with this partnership to adding value to our salespeople and as well as the consumer. Yep. Minister, the next point that I would like to dive into is about cooling measures. Yes. A very hot topic. Um, probably a lot of audience, I think right no now... No pun intended, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think a lot of, uh, of the people, including the Facebook Live right now, some of our customers, some of our partners, and, and hi to everyone and so on. Thank you so much for joining us this morning together with our special segment with Minister for National Development. Thank you, sir. So, the, on cooling measures, I must say, we had huge rounds of cooling measures, 201213, and the latest was in 2018, July. Mm. And I, to a huge extent, well agree. The cooling measures that we have put in place is what is helping us in this pandemic. And I can vouch for that. Yes. Simply because despite the pandemic, 
we did not see a collapse in the property prices yes. unlike previous crises yes. during the SARS, a similar pandemic yes. of a different magnitude, mm. or for that matter, even a global financial crisis where property prices drop hugely more than 20% yes. in four quarters. But we are not experiencing this. And simply because of some of the cooling measures really eradicated mm. speculators because of seller's stamp duty and as well as ABSD. Mm. However, Minister, mm. A cooling measures cannot be in cold storage forever. Hmm. That's, that's our thinking. And the current uh, pandemic, and as well as uh, the market is not really at its, in the forefront. No doubt we have seen some increased number of transactions. They are more of a pent-up demand. Moving forward, I look at it, the market and the economy is not so favourable. My question here is this. As the Minister for National Development, uh, probably the government, or in, in fact, if I put it, probably you are in the best position to look into these other opportunities to calibrate some of these cooling measures, mm. number one. And two, if at all, what are the indicators or the levers that will allow to calibrate some of these cooling measures? Yes. No, no measure is, uh, is, is perpetual. And all measures are intended to achieve certain outcomes. And uh, whilst you gave credit to the cooling measures uh, for what appears to be the current stability of the uh, property sector uh, currently, I think there may be many other factors. And so uh, certainly uh, we've seen in, in previous uh, uh, economic downturns that market steep correction has been harmful uh, to homeowners, to uh, genuine home buyers, and certainly also to real estate consultants and agents as well. Uh, if left to its natural uh, devices, the property market tends, uh, not, to, not only in Singapore, but in many other markets like ours, to go into that boom-bust cycle, uh, run, running up uh, and pulling away from economic fundamentals, uh, tends to happen when you have speculators, when you have uh, hot money, when you have flows coming from abroad that are looking for good returns and stability. And that has not been uh, favourable to genuine homeowners and home buyers yeah. and to people who are in the property sector yeah. in whatever role uh, and, and position for the long haul. Yeah. Uh, so that, that, has, that is quite clear and, and you, your, your experience yeah. uh, has led you to make that point uh, yeah. very firmly earlier. And, and certainly for us, our objective is to ensure that uh, property prices, and you know Singaporeans uh, put a lot of investment in, in property uh, a lot of it is because it's their home, it's yeah. a nest egg. Uh, th that we ensure that uh, there is some stability in the property market, that it doesn't run away from economic fundamentals, and that has been something we've said repeatedly. And so we continue to keep an eye uh, on uh, macroeconomic uh, factors. We continue to keep an eye on whether the property market is following economic uh, cycles. For now, our assessment is that uh, the uh, property market is stable, but you know, whenever there, there are crises, particularly of a crisis of a generation, uh, we're looking at all aspects, you know, many areas, both the public health aspect, the economic aspect, job aspect, social aspect. And uh, the property market has an impact on people's well-being, on their financial health, on their uh, uh, retirement adequacy, uh, and also on their, their social well-being and family well-being. So it's, it's uh, of, of, of a great importance to, to government and certainly to all our partners, including our real estate partners. And so we continue to keep an eye on, on this and whether there needs to be any calibration or any adjustment, I think we ultimately keep an eye on the, uh, the, the economic uh, factor and whether the market is in line with or is pulling away from uh, that. Uh, so, so it's something that we are, we are very, very watchful about and you can be assured uh, that if there are any adjustments that need to be made, it will be based on those considerations. Thank you so much, Minister, for giving the assurance that the cooling measures are not meant in a permanent feature. Yep, that's important. Uh, I totally agree, uh, as you said, that we will continue to keep on a close watch. Uh, two areas that we would like to bring to the attention, maybe it's worth looking at here, will be uh, we think the core central region. Uh, because of the huge number of on block transactions in the years of 2017 and 18, yes. and we look at the balance supply, but I think we have put it in some paper to give it to you subsequently. Uh, there's in a little bit of an, 
uh, disconnect between supply and demand, and particularly with the restrictions of foreigners coming in and inflow of the funds. Yes. So for Propnex, we are not one advocating a total removal of the cooling measures. Mm. We are always for calibrating, as we believe that only a sustainable real estate market yes. will make meaning to my salespeople and the community by at large. So that being the case, uh, the two point here is this, it may be worth looking at the core central region because it is relatively hefty, 20% ABSD on foreigners and the inflows are being very much reduced in the current situation. And moving forward, it might be the case mm. because of the current global outlook. And number two, here is the Singaporean buying the second property. Yes. Used to be 7%, um, but because of the runaway prices uh, two years back, as part of the 2018 uh, cooling measures was increased to 12%. 12%. This is really seriously worth re-looking at it. Maybe we go back one step uh, to pre-2018 uh, time, where it is still 7%. And the reason why I'm trying to say here is this, we always felt that it need to be self-sustaining. I mean, globally, everybody is now trying to be self-sustaining in terms of uh, resiliency. And I always felt it is not wrong for Singaporeans who can afford to buy a second property rather than push them out to go and invest overseas because they want to avoid the additional 12% ABSD and end up risking their uh, retirement uh, ignorance because the foreign policies are very different, the currency policies are very different, and some consumers may not well have a good understanding. So these are the two areas, if at all, in any of the calibration, to seriously do in a study, Minister. No, no thank you. I, 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 I've also encountered people who have given this feedback before. And uh, as, as I said, uh, all policies we continuously review, and uh, not just at a macro level, but also looking at the impact on, on Singaporeans individually. Uh, there, there are many uh, considerations that sometimes tug in opposite directions. You know, on the one hand, we want to ensure the property market uh, and the uh, industry as a whole remains healthy, especially in a crisis like this, because it's detrimental to Singaporeans as a whole if the sector uh, takes a, a big tumble. Uh, we also want to uh, recognise the aspirations of Singaporeans who want to be able to, to invest in property, and whether that means renting or selling to, to, to people who come from overseas. Uh, but at the same time, there are many Singaporeans who are concerned about ensuring or they want to ensure that uh, housing in Singapore, public as well as private housing, mm. remains within the reach of Singaporeans yes. who are genuine home buyers and home owners. Yes. Uh, so whether it's an investment, whether it's a home or, or the health of the, of the industry as a whole, all these are sometimes uh, not always aligned on every, every point. Uh, but, but I think we take your, your views on board and the feedback of many Singaporeans uh, about the, the, the issue of the APSD and we continue to study them. Thank you so much, Minister, again yeah. for the assurance. Last point on this topic before we go on to something else. Sure. And one of the uh, uh, recent, I think it has also been in the forefront in some of the medias, uh, some of the challenges of genuine HDB upgraders. Right. We are talking about, obviously, an HDB upgrader have an option mm. to buy an EC because when they buy an executive condominium, they get a full remission on the additional stamp duty of 12%. But unfortunately, not every Singaporean can buy an EC either based on the income or for that matter, ECs are not available widespread uh, in locations where their families or parents are staying. Mm. Therefore, the true aspirations of many Singaporeans and especially more HDB flats are attaining the MOP of five years. Mm. They, and they're always looking at a hoarding that says new launch coming soon. It could be in Haugang, it could be in Tampines, it could be elsewhere. The biggest hurdle HDB upgraders today face is the additional 12% ABSD, even though they don't have an intent to keep the HDB. So what they are doing here is this. Many of them are hurriedly selling the HDB so that they can avoid paying the 12% for their aspiration and dream home. In this process, they go through some challenges. Because they sell the HDB, they go into rental or shifting with their parents until these properties is TOP. Mm. That is one inconvenience. And second thing here is this, there is no intention on their part to deny the government one cent mm. because actually they qualify to get back. Yes, but this is something that I really think is 
seriously worth looking into it? And is there something that we could do about it, Minister? Yeah. So all these issues we continue to review and look at, particularly in light of the current climate. Uh, I know that uh, there are people who genuinely want to upgrade and have, uh, have saved long and hard for that uh, dream home that they're looking forward to for themselves and for their families. Uh, and we certainly want to continue to review measures, even as we want to ensure that measures to keep the uh, housing market stable are really to the benefit of, of genuine homeowners and home buyers. So we continue to calibrate and review some of these measures. But also, especially in light of uh, this current climate, you know, uh, uh, people are more concerned about job stability. And you know, of late, uh, what has been uh, 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 what has been. Uh, on, on, on the front page of, of, of our, our newspapers and really weighing on many Singaporeans' minds is about job stability. And even big companies uh, push into very difficult straits, have had to make very tough decisions uh, about, the, about their staff. And, and so at this point in time, we also want to be collectively as Singaporeans uh, very prudent and careful, especially when you enter into commitments that uh, are very long term. And you know, as a as a as a as a real estate company, uh, the prudence and the long term sustainability uh, of of an investment in a home, I think, are big ticket items. And uh, it's for the well being of Singaporeans that some of these measures are there. We recognise that uh, at at some some stages it can cause some pain and friction to genuine home buyers, but we'll continue to study those measures to see how we can enable those who are aspiring and have prepared well for, for, their, for their upgrade to be able to do so, whilst ensuring that we, we, we reduce the risk of speculation and runaway prices that will hurt everyone. Thank you so much, Minister. We are totally in tandem. Mm. Uh, we want a sustainable real estate. Mm. Uh, as you said, it's worth looking at some of the things moving forward if we can improve some of those areas. Yes. Actually, if I have, I've got many more questions but time is always in the essence and we've got a couple of other things. Yeah. And again, thank you so much for taking time. But I'm going to ask one last question, Minister. Happy to. Yeah. You know, in Singapore, it's such a small island in the city. Today, actually, it really doesn't make a huge amount of a difference whether you are staying really in the city centre of the core. In fact, sometimes at the city centre itself, downtown, seems to have less uh, uh, activities and lifestyle as compared to townships that are now so beautifully designed yes. and the convenience. Mm. And we have always talked about, you know, in, in our master plans, either it is the Jurong rejuvenations, or now we recently, we talk about the greater southern waterfront. What do you see the landscape of Singapore moving forward? Um, I'm not asking you where the hotspots to invest, but I'm trying to say Singapore is continuously improving. And what is, is there something that people can look out for? Uh, where are the next areas of uh, further changes of improvement in Singapore? As, 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 as I said, we want to continue to rejuvenate Singapore. We were never done improving our home and never done developing Singapore. And in so doing, we, we meet the aspirations of Singaporeans, rejuvenate our city in order to meet the aspirations of future generations and to make life better more livable. And there are many pieces of work that we've embarked upon that continue uh, to be work in progress. Uh, Save city nature. I talked about it a couple of days ago to the Straits Times. How, uh, as a small city, highly dense, we want it to be livable. We want to be able to harness the services that nature can provide to make life better, to make our environment better, and to make our estates better as well, and to enable communities to, to rise and communities to grow, along with the city nature. But there are also many other developments as well. You know, the uh, Pali Bar mm. plans, yes. the Greater Southern Waterfront, yeah. the, uh, the efforts to transform uh, Jurong Lake District into yes. our second major central business district outside the, the existing CBD, mm. already taking shape and looking, yes. you know, take, developing quite showing nicely, results showing now. results. And it's yeah. green, it's also uh, high tech, it's also connected. Uh, and so that's work in progress. Uh, but ensuring our development also remains socially inclusive. Mm. So one major challenge we always face is you know, when we uh, start redeveloping prime areas, including the Greater Southern Waterfront. Uh, we've made commitments to ensure that there will be public housing. Mm. There will be 
public amenities. Mm. Uh, we cannot, uh, even in a small island at ours, uh, have enclaves, yeah. uh, have, uh, uh, have, have inequality manifest in where people live, work and play. Yeah. And so uh, one point that my uh, predecessor, Minister Lawrence Wong, has start, embarked upon, which I will have to continue that work, yeah. is how can we enable uh, public housing in prime areas mm. for Singaporeans from all walks of life mm. to say, I can live here mm. and not uh, uh, create, say, perverse outcomes and incentives mm. or worse, entrenched stratification. Mm. So housing is not uh, just about the home and family and well-being or about investment. Yeah. It's also about community yeah. and housing, especially public housing in Singapore, is first and foremost social policy. Yes. It's about home, it's about your well-being, it's about your sense of, of where you've come yeah. and about ensuring that Singaporeans can live even in, in prime areas, yeah. but the policies have to be calibrated right yes. and it's always a, a challenge to get it uh, spot on. Thank you so much, Minister. I would only conclude by saying one thing. I never envy a position. <laughs> I'll tell you why. As you exactly said, it is the desire to bring even like Greater Southern Waterfront a public housing. It's not going to be cheap. But on the other hand, like for example, Pinnacle at Duxton, you know, that is one of the uh, highest million dollar transaction properties in Singapore, even for this year. People bought it at a fraction of the time, but today they had a windfall. So people are always guessing what will be the price at Great the southern waterfront of public housing B. Mm. Yeah. And is there going to be another windfall for those people? You know, sometimes the BTO is really by a little bit of an luck and you know the subscription rates are so high. Yeah. So it is going to be complex and it is not easy. And that falls on your uh, ministry and the department. But we always know there must be an affair opportunities for every Singaporean who can afford. Yes. Uh, it is not meant for everybody, every place, because people should live within our means. Yes. Uh, so that's something that we are totally supportive. And thank you once again, unless you want to say any other things, uh, just because of my last conversation about this public housing and so on. Uh, I'm really appreciate every moment and every sharing of yours. And I hopefully not only our prop next salespeople, mm. including our audience in the Facebook, mm. have some takeaway the, as far as the today's real estate market in Singapore. Well, thank you very much. I'm really appreciative of Propnex for inviting us to be able to share some of our thoughts, our concerns, our views, and for giving us very constructive feedback on how we can partner each other uh, in this industry, government, the industry, to advance the well-being of the sector, the industry, and ensure a stable housing and property market for Singaporeans as a whole. And really, we hope to continue to advance the spirit of partnership between government and our real estate sector, uh, the construction sector, our civil society, to continue that partnership, in fact, to strengthen it, because the challenges will be even greater in the years to come. There will be very, very complex issues that uh, require lots of trade-offs to be negotiated. And if we can partner each other, we have a freer flow of ideas and views and information be able to bring people along with us as we have to make difficult decisions in the future. Uh, but also, all of us collectively recognising that we are stewards of this little island of ours, stewards of the resources, whether uh, we, how much resources we put in the subsidies, say, for even in Greater Southern Waterfront, say. Yep. Those resources are, are, are for us to steward and not to, to, to spend. Yep. Stewarded for future generations. And so on that, on that note, I'd like to thank you and look forward to many more conversations to come and to the... Uh, hard work of our real estate sector and our real estate partners. I'd like to thank you all uh, and wish you all the best uh, in the year ahead. Thank you so much, Minister. Once again, can count on us and Propnex. We will partner in giving more feedback for a sustainable real estate market in Singapore.